Good morning. First, let me thank the organizers of the Public Interest Environment Law Conference of the United Kingdom for having invited me to deliver this virtual keynote address at your 2021 conference. I appreciate that very much. In particular, I wish to thank Lois Lane, the chair of the PIELC UK and her colleague, Olive Burchell, for the invitation. When I first received the invitation, I wondered what it would be like to deliver a virtual keynote address. I have never done that in my life before. And I thought it would be good to enhance the virtual keynote with virtual technology, meaning perhaps some pictures and some film footage as part of the keynote. So don't be surprised if you see some of that in the course of this keynote. I am currently the head of the independent redress mechanism of the Green Climate Fund. However, today I'm here in my personal capacity as an environmental lawyer. The views I express today are my own and they do not represent the Green Climate Fund. The topic for the 2021 PIELC UK conference is after the storm, environmental law. I want to divide this keynote address into three parts. The first part is where I want to discuss with you what we mean by the storm and how environmental law relates to that experience of the storm that we're just coming out of. I want to discuss both the positives and the negatives of the storm. This, in the second part, I want to discuss what the post-2021 public interest environmental law landscape might look like. And in the third part, I want to share with you some ideas of how public interest environmental lawyers may want to shape their thoughts and actions uh, in the post-2021 uh, period. Now, the most obvious aspects of the storm that we experienced in 2020 and now continuing into 2021 is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. But there are also other aspects of, a, of the storm that we should not forget. For example, there is the rise in awareness of racial discrimination, of systemic racial discrimination, raised by movements, for example, like the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, but also in other parts of the world. Then there is the continuing Me Too movement, raising awareness about the sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment of women. Then we also have the existential crisis that humanity is facing with climate change, which is becoming more and more serious day by day. And then, of course, for you in the United Kingdom, you have Brexit, which became a reality at the end of 2020. All of these different aspects, led by the pandemic, of course, form the idea of the storm, which we have all experienced in different ways, some more than others, and which we are continuing to experience as we go into 2021. But the important thing about storms is that they never last forever. Storms have a beginning, a middle and an end. And they will all at some point die down and calm will return or a degree of calm will return. And that will also be true for all of those things that I described to you as part of the storm, including the COVID-19 pandemic. So there is hope for the future. There is a light at the end of the tunnel that we can always look to with regard to storms. Let us look at the positives and negatives of the storms that we have experienced. Let us turn our attention to the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. As at today, some 2.8 million people have died fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, spouses, 
lovers. 131 million people have caught the disease, of whom some 74 million have recovered. Staggering numbers across the world in literally every single country. That is the negative of the pandemic, a terrible toll. But there is also the positive side. In a very short period of time, within just one year, we as human beings, using the technology, the science that we have developed over the years, we have succeeded in manufacturing several vaccines to deal with this virus. A Pfizer-BioNTech, Moderna, j and AstraZeneca, a Russian vaccine, a Chinese vaccine, and several other vaccines in development. These vaccines are now being administered. Millions have already received it, and it will change the course of the pandemic. One of the most frightening things about this pandemic is how quickly it spread. Let's look at how the virus, which began in China, spread very quickly around the world in about six months. You see that because of air travel, because of motor travel, because of, uh, of the ability of human beings to travel quickly around the world, the virus is able to piggyback and travel with them and spread across the world very quickly. So that advantage that technology gave us also becomes our Achilles heel. On the other hand, as each country began to lock down and to impose travel restrictions, quarantine requirements, testing and so on, we were all forced to work virtually, stay at home, some to abandon their work, others to close down businesses. But a fair amount of work continued because of the technological advancements we had through the internet, through Zoom and Webex and so on and so forth, that we were able to connect with each other, talk to each other, see each other halfway across the globe and conduct business. Virtual meetings have enabled us to continue to do a fair quantum of work, which we would not have otherwise been able to do because of this pandemic. This is another positive. And while we worked virtually, without our even realizing it, we have all lowered our carbon footprint. We have reduced the amount of international travel, which burnt a lot of fossil fuels. We have reduced the amount of land travel, which also burns a lot of fossil fuels, to the point that the evidence suggested that if we continued like this, we could meet our carbon reduction goals set by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. But we already know that things will not continue like this. Our carbon footprint will grow again very quickly and international travel will return to the levels that they were before the pandemic once the vaccines have taken hold and the pandemic is under control. Let me turn now to some of the other aspects of the storm that we have experienced. With the death of George Floyd in the middle of 2020, new concerns were raised about systemic racism in the United States of America. This awareness has also triggered concerns in many other countries where racial discrimination has been an issue. Whether you think racism is systemic or not, people of color have felt discriminated for a long time and they are now demanding equality. I can say from personal experience as a person of color that I have felt discriminated from time to time in my life. Sometimes it has come in the form of a public verbal attack and sometimes 
in the form of subtle avoidance, for example, of sitting next to me, even though the bus was crowded and the only seat left was the one next to me. As a result of the increased awareness about racial discrimination, movements such as the Black Lives Matter movement have gathered strength and in the United States have even sometimes resulted in violent conflict in some areas. But at the same time, the same raised awareness is resulting in efforts to reform the police and to bring in new ideas around community policing. Of course, on the one extreme, you have a call for defunding the police, while on the other, you have a call for reforming the police. There are positives and negatives as a result of that part of the storm as well. And then there is the Me Too movement, where rightly women who have been sexually harassed, abused or exploited at the workplace or at home can now speak out more boldly about it and those responsible are increasingly being held to account. Another aspect of the storm is climate change. Climate change is accelerating. The evidence is clear. And there is no doubt in the minds of those who actually believe in science that climate change is here and poses the biggest existential threat to humanity. This threat and the message that we need to act with regard to climate change could not have been said better than by Greta Thunberg at the recent United Nations meeting. My message is that we'll be watching you. <laughs> this is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet, you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet, I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? The pandemic has set off an economic downturn across the globe, requiring developed nations to invest more funds in reviving their own internal economies. In time, it is very likely that aid budgets, development aid budgets to developing countries would therefore also be cut down. Poverty and joblessness has reached gargantuan proportions in developed and developing countries. And this economic downturn is so severe that in some places it is leading to conflict. And of course, in the United Kingdom, you have Brexit now. And Brexit will bring within, for lawyers, a great challenge with regard to reforming many different laws which have been influenced by European economic laws. And in many ways, through efforts to regain the sovereignty of parliament. And yet, despite all of these challenges, you also have tremendously positive, uh, innovative outcomes that we can cite during this storm. One of them is the fact that there is already ongoing efforts to put satellites into space that would allow internet access for all. You have these kinds of positive efforts being made, notwithstanding the economic downturn. Arguably, this is the perfect storm that hum humanity has faced for a long time. 
But storms, as I said earlier, don't last forever. They are time and space limited. They will eventually go away or change. The question is, how will we all come out of it? Will we be more resilient and able to cope with such events in the future? Or will we forget after a while and return to our old ways? Can we learn from this experience and improve and build upon it and move upward? The 2021 PIELC UK conference is posing these questions in the context of public interest environmental law. No doubt, it will be posed innumerable times in other areas as well. We as humans have a remarkable ability to think through and discuss challenges such as these we can even research past history, draw analogies and analyze optional pathways as to how we can change behavior to become more resilient and smarter. But we also have a remarkable inability and inertia to change our behavior. We are for the most part set in our ways and it takes enormous social efforts to change human behaviors at the community, national and global levels. We don't need to go far to see the struggles we face in changing behavior. For example, mask wearing has become politicized in the United States. Vaccination hesitancy is rampant everywhere, mostly driven by misinformation. Climate change skeptics abound and politicians still debate in some places, whether there is or is not climate change, and resist even small changes that can enable carbon neutrality. I now want to turn to the second part of my address, to look at the landscape that is likely to take shape after 2021. Virtual communication will be here to stay. Remote working will be here to stay. Masks will very likely be ubiquitous for some years to come. There will be near universal internet access. Cyber attacks and cyber crime is likely to rise. There will also be movements seeking greater equality and less discrimination, racial discrimination, with perhaps significant police reforms. The economy, despite the downturn, is likely to pick up in a couple of years. Climate change will likely exacerbate, given the unwillingness of nations to act and act in a timely way. And it is more likely than not that it will result in intense hurricanes, cyclones, tornadoes, wildfires, floods, droughts, and new vector-borne diseases, resulting in billions of property damage and significant, serious impacts on human populations. This kind of crisis is likely to result in mass scale movement of populations and immigration, putting pressure on both developed and developing countries. Never before in the Earth's entire history has there come a point such as this, a point in which a single species, we human beings, can unleash dramatic changes all over the globe. Human beings today have the capacity to bring about global positive change. They have mastery over much of technology. They have mastery over a lot of science. And they have mastery over political systems. And they can also bring about negative outcomes because of that same mastery. So humans have reached the crossroads at this point, the one path that would take us 
to increased crisis upon crisis, increasing poverty, increasing climate change, and the adverse impacts that it brings, and all of the negatives we can think of. Or we can go down the other path in which we can mitigate or reduce or completely eliminate climate change. We have the technology to do that. We have the science. We have the political systems to do that. And achieve a lifestyle in which we can follow the three basic principles of reuse, recycle, and reduce in everything we do. The reduce principle has within its ambit the idea of efficiency, whether it be the efficient use of energy or reducing food waste and using our food efficiently. Within the reuse principle, we have the idea that everything can, must be environmentally friendly from the beginning, from the cradle, all the way to the grave. One man's waste becomes another man's raw material. And within the recycle principle, we have the idea that once something is used and consumed, it can always be recovered and converted to something different. So in all of these ideas, we have the wherewithal to follow a different path. That is perhaps the vision that we, would we need to have as public interest uh, environmental lawyers for the future. Within that vision, what is it that we as environmental lawyers can do? What are the ideas that we can think about as we look to the future and as we emerge from this storm. Going down this alternate path of positive outcomes will not be possible unless the different stakeholders come together and collaborate with each other in order to achieve that end. And by stakeholders, I mean the government, and by government also I mean the national government, the local governments, the provincial governments, subnational level governments on the one hand. The private sector on the other hand, a very important player, civil society, and we as citizens, we need to all collaborate and come together in order to go down that path and achieve the positive outcomes we want to achieve. I think it has already been well established that you can run a business in a way that is profitable and yet environmentally friendly. The notion that somehow environmentally friendly uh, conduct on the one hand is incompatible with profit making um, has been long debunked. And many businesses actually now have adopted the idea that efficiency improves your profitability that reuse and recycling improves your profitability. And consumers are beginning to increasingly demand that kind of behavior from the private sector. But as you look down supply chains, as supply chains get away further and further away from the developed economies in which some of these ideas are more pronounced and trickle down into developing countries, there you still find a lot of exploitation of labor and exploitation of resources in ways that are not sustainable. So it is not sufficient to concentrate on ensuring that these practices come alive in the developed world. It is critical, perhaps even more important, to ensure that they take root and grow in the developing world. So the challenge of going down this new path is a heavy lift, but as history has proved, human beings, we are capable of going down that path. We have the technology, we have the science, we have the economic knowledge and the political uh, systems to do it. What we lack perhaps is the political will to go down that path. 
I now want to turn to the, the last part of my address and look to some ideas that we can use as public interest environmental lawyers as we go beyond 2021. These are general ideas that you can use in different uh, contexts, but I hope that these ideas will generate discussion and I'm sure there'll be many more ideas that you will come across in the three panels that form this conference. And I hope that at the end of the conference, you will go back with ideas that you can bring to life in your day-to-day -day work as public interest environmental lawyers. The first of these ideas I wish to discuss with you has to do with our past focus as environmental lawyers on the creation of precedent, of judicial precedent on the creation of the jurisprudence of environmental sustainability and to refocus our attention on doing those things that would bring about positive changes in human behavior and positive environmental outcomes that are widespread. Let me illustrate this through an example. In the 1990s, my dear good friend, M.C. Mehta of India, an advocate, began a campaign to clean up the Ganges River. The Ganges is, as we all know, is the, uh, one of the longest rivers in India, and it is a sacred river to Indians and to Hindus. He brought a series of cases, litigation in the Supreme Court using its human rights jurisdiction, its fundamental rights jurisdiction, in the hope that by arguing that the right to life included the right to a clean environment, he could get the court to force hundreds of municipalities down the river, hundreds of industrial establishments down the river to change their uh, practices and to install basic uh, pollution control equipment to ensure that they complied with environmental standards in discharging their waste into the river. Much of the river is polluted through fecal and industrial waste. Thousands of cases resulted from this litigation. Thousands of industries were put under judicial orders to clean up their act. Pollution control boards at the local level were mandated and overseen by, judici by the judiciary to ensure that they were doing a proper job. To the point that some were even arguing that the judiciary had taken over the role of the executive. At the end of the day, <clears throat> we are now some 20 or 30 years since that litigation started. It is still to some extent ongoing. The question that we need to ask is, is the river any cleaner today than it was when MC Mehta commenced his litigation? No doubt we have got extremely good Indian judicial precedent with regard to the right to life, the right to including the right to the environment, what those standards are and so on. But has it resulted in the outcome that MC Mehta was looking for? The fact of the matter is the Ganges River continues to be polluted to this day. So on the one hand, while we as environmental lawyers have created the precedence, the jurisprudence around environmental sustainability, it has not quite resulted in the outcomes that we were looking for. Certainly the River Ganges is perhaps cleaner than it was then, but it is far from being in the state that MC Mehta really wants it to be in. So what is it that we need to do differently in the future? Are there public interest actions, including litigation that we can change that would force behavioral change across the board in this way? And the final case I want to touch base on from my personal experience is a case that I bought in, in 1999 and 2000 was an air pollution case. The air pollution situation in the capital city of Colombo had become very bad. 
mostly because of, of vehicular emissions. So I brought a case in which we were able to force the government to establish mobile air pollution standards for fuel standards. There was a lot of lead in the fuel at the time and also for standards for imported vehicles. We got those regulations within six months of the conclusion of the, of the case. It was settled, but it took a number of years before those regulations actually came to be implemented. Today, you have a system in Sri Lanka in which annually you have to go and get your vehicle tested uh, for air pollution and you have to get a certificate uh, which then has to be presented in order for you to get your annual license. So the systems have now been put in place. But the question is, is the air pollution in the city of Colombo any better? Perhaps it's a little bit better, but it is not anywhere near where it should be. It is still quite polluted. If you look at the air quality um, readings for the city of Colombo today, you will see that it, the air pollution is quite high. So while we got some good precedents, we got even some good regulations, we have not been able to achieve the environmental outcome which we were looking for. Continuing on the theme of air pollution, I still remember being in India with my family and uh, hiring a, a vehicle to travel to see the Taj Mahal. We were on our way and somewhere we were stopped by a policeman and the driver of our vehicle got off. He went and I could see him in the rear view mirror speaking with the policeman and eventually pulling some money out and giving it to the policeman and he came back and we continued on our journey. So I asked him what happened and he said, no, I paid the police officer some a bribe basically. Uh, and I said, but what was the problem? He said, well, I did not have my air pollution certificate. And then we were stopped again in a different state. We had to cross the state boundary by a policeman and the same thing happened again. So I asked my driver, you paid two bribes already to two police officers. Why, how much does it actually cost you to go and get this certificate and how long is it going to take? He said, it'll probably take maybe 15 minutes and it'll, it'll cost me 300 rupees. He had already paid the, the policeman 200 rupees, 100 rupees each. So on our way back after seeing the Taj Mahal, I persuaded him to drive into a um, testing center and he pulled up the car to the test site and he went in and he was back within a few minutes with his certificate. So I said, but I didn't see the car being tested. He said, no, I paid another hundred rupees and got the certificate. So basically he paid 300 rupees, a hundred rupees to the testing center, hundred rupees to two policemen, which is a total of 300 rupees, which is what he would have paid in the first place to get a proper test and a proper certificate. And it showed me very clearly that though we have won the rules and the regulations and the judicial precedents, the system isn't working because of other reasons, corruption, inefficiency in the system and just lack of resources to implement these rules. This phenomena that I'm describing is probably applicable to all countries in the world, though it would apply in different degrees. So you have a higher degree of corruption in some of the developing countries and much less of that, for example, in the United Kingdom or in Europe or even in the United States. Uh, same thing would apply with regard to efficiency and with regard to resource scarcity or uh, the lack of funding uh, for agencies to actually implement the law. What I would suggest is that public interest lawyers going forward from 2021 onwards, while certainly continuing to litigate on very specific issues such as a particular factory that may be discharging its wastewater into a river or a particular development project that is causing impacts to communities, host communities, while you litigate those issues, also try to step back and ask yourself the question whether 
that litigation by itself will achieve the overall environmental outcomes, social outcomes and economic outcomes that you are looking for in the public interest. And if they're not, then do consider whether litigation should be part of a broader strategy involving perhaps a broader campaign, including the media, and indeed other things such as mediation or alternate dispute resolution methods that could hopefully bring a broader group of stakeholders around the same table and through mediation efforts reach compromises that are win-win from the sustainable development, from the environmental, from the social point of view. Another idea I would like to present to you as public interest lawyers going forward from 2021 onwards is to look for cross-fertilization in the field of the law. So you may be litigating a particular issue on which you might find that the law is sparse. You may not find many precedents, you may not find the exact statutes you're looking for, but there may well be concepts, legal concepts that may come from other branches of the law, whether it be through perhaps derivative actions which are found in company law, or the idea of the trust, which is found in trust law, or other such fields of law, which may be in some ways far removed from environmental law. Look for cross-fertilization, look for borrowing concepts which you can adapt and use by way of argumentation uh, in your cases. That is one way in which in the past as well, we have been able to expand the jurisprudence around sustainable development. These ideas could come from company law, from property law, from administrative law and constitutional law, which has been a traditional area from which we have always borrowed ideas, but also from the law of trusts. The final idea I would like you to think about as we go forward is the importance of combining your public interest work with powerful narratives. If you look at the duration in which humanity has learned to commit one's thoughts to writing, in other words, how old is writing? It may be 5,000, 6,000, maximum 7,000 years old, just by looking at archeological evidence of the writings that we have today, some of the oldest languages. 7,000 years is not a long time, considering that, that Homo sapiens and before that other species of human beings have been on this earth for a much longer period of time. And the question then arises, how is it that we as a species communicated our ideas, our knowledge and our wisdom to generations and generations? We did so through oral traditions, not through writing. And this is an important point because over this long period of time when we were using oral traditions to communicate our wisdom, we have somehow been hardwired to absorb stories, to absorb narrative much better than we do data and analysis and reports and so on. And this is one of the reasons why we scientists are finding it very challenging to convince politicians with scientific data. And there is therefore a gap between scientific data and scientific reasoning and scientific findings and political will, because somehow the messaging is not getting through to the politicians. And that is because politicians tend to build their campaigns around narratives. Many of these narratives are supported by data, are supported by research but there have also been in history many powerful narratives that have moved uh, countries, that have moved societies, that have changed human behavior simply through the power of narrative. And what is important, narrative, which was not based on data or research or fact, was in fact based on complete fiction and imagination alone. 
we don't have to go far. The entire Second World War, which was driven by the Nazis in Germany, was based upon a lie. But it was a powerful narrative. It changed the dynamics of social thinking in a very important European country for a period of time. And the entire world had to fight this, this narrative. And more recently, you see narratives in which there is questions being raised about elections and voter fraud and so on, and narratives on both sides being developed, you know, which some of which are based on fiction, some of which may be based on some data. But what is important to understand here is the narratives, storytelling, which resonate with people can move people and change their behavior, perhaps far more than data and analysis. So we have as public interest lawyers, as responsible citizens to find a way to bridge that gap between the data and the science that we know is telling us, for example, that there's climate change and that this is an existential threat. We have to take that data and somehow convert it to powerful narratives that can move human beings to change behavior. And I'm afraid that's not quite happening because that would then move human beings to change behavior and to deal with climate change. That has not happened yet. So for the public interest lawyer, my message is when you bring a case, don't just think of the legal precedent, step back and think of the broader outcomes that you're looking for. And while you do that, build a powerful narrative, not only for your case, that's very important, but also for that broader outcome. And it is always best if litigation is just part of a much broader strategy in which you are seeking to bring about sustainable environmental and, uh, and just social outcomes. These then are the ideas I wish to present to you. And so to bring my address to a conclusion, let me summarize very quickly. The key messages I want to present to you is that we are coming out of a storm which consists not just of the pandemic, but also of other important aspects of social change that is going on, such as systemic racial discrimination, the Me Too movement, the rights of women to be free of sexual harassment and abuse and exploitation. And this storm is not something that's going to entirely die down, but it will die down in the course of this year and the next. The second point I wish to make to you is that the landscape looking forward is one in which the public interest lawyer will have to continue to play a critical role, but this role would need to change and adapt to the new landscape that is being created with a virtual meetings coming in, with uh, remote working coming in, these becoming part of the new normal that is going to be established, but also greater awareness about racial discrimination and systemic issues relating to discrimination around the world, the Me Too movement and so on. There are many public issues, uh, interest issues beyond the environmental issues that would need to be addressed by the public interest lawyer. In doing so, my final uh, message to you is not, do not only concentrate on creating the precedents, the judicial precedents, and that is important work to continue, but step back and ask yourself whether you are in fact achieving the broader outcomes of social justice, the broader outcomes of sustainable development and environmental protection um, that you have been working towards in the public interest and think of developing powerful narratives and in doing so also borrow from other areas of the law, maybe even from other disciplines, uh, ideas that you can bring and use as seeds to develop new jurisprudence. And so with that, thank you very much for uh, being here. And I hope you have a great uh, conference, which is full of discussion and full of ideas. And I hope you take away from this conference something valuable that you can use in your daily lives as public interest environment lawyers. Thank you very much.